one other point on that, Paul, that I think is a real mistake that the press has made, and frankly, I think that the vaccine companies have made, is they have not communicated clearly the difference between relative risk reduction and absolute risk reduction. So when the J&J &J vaccine received its emergency youth authorization, I think the headline grabbing statement was, hey, we just heard that Pfizer is, I'm, 96% you know, effective and Moderna 95% effective, but J&J &J looks like it's only 66% effective. Those numbers are probably off by a couple of percent, but directionally they are correct. And at the surface, you would say, why in the world would you take the J&J &J vaccine, even though it's only a single shot? Or you might ask another question, which is, well, what happens if you took two shots of the J&J? &J? Wouldn't that put it on par, et cetera? And it turns out I actually had to go back and look at the data to actually see what the true risk reduction was. Now, I won't go into it here for people because it would take too long, but we'll link to it in the show notes. We have an entire post I've written about the difference between absolute risk reduction and relative risk reduction, but you must talk about this in terms of absolute risk reduction. And when you look at the absolute risk reduction, it turns out that the J&J &J vaccine has a 1.7% percent absolute risk reduction versus a 1.2 percent absolute risk reduction for Moderna. And I believe Pfizer is actually less than 1 percent risk reduction. These are all great vaccines, but it turns out that J&J &J gets the most bang for its buck. Now, um, I wanted to talk with you about why you think there is that discordance between the lowest relative risk reduction in the mid 60s and the highest absolute risk reduction, which is the number that matters, approaching 2%. Do you believe that the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines were tested on less susceptible populations and that, you know, that J and that J, J was just tested on a sicker population that was therefore going to benefit more greatly? Well, so there are different strategies. So, so uh, it is interesting how both mRNA strategies had very similar, um, at least relative risk, risk reduction. But you're right. I mean, that it, it is interesting how we don't talk about that way. We also don't talk about that with, way with regard to safety issues. Um, the the so if you if you look for example, I'm trying to remember the specific numbers for the Pfizer trial, but there were like 165 cases of of uh, disease in the placebo group and like eight cases in the in the vaccine group. So that's 165 cases per in this the in the case of the uh, the Pfizer trial was a was a f roughly 40,000 person trial. So you're roughly it's like 165 cases, you know, per 20,000 people that got placebo as compared to like um, a, a tw yeah, right as compared to eight cases per 20,000 people who got the vaccine. So when you actually divide that all up, you know, there's the the absolute difference is not is is uh, is is much less dramatic than than is you know the sort of the relative right. risk. The, I mean, the it's, Pfizer it's, 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 absolute risk difference was like 0.9 percent, and you're right. The right. total number of cases was about 170 total cases in tw uh, 20,000 or. 40,000, I'm sorry. 40,000. Yeah, but right, you're right. Yeah. The difference was eight versus like 165 or something like that. Um, and which again makes me just think like these are people who were either less exposed, more healthy. There was something in these populations that differed dramatically from the J and J population, where I mean, we're talking about 500 infections versus 100 infections directionally. Um, so the relative reduction wasn't as high, but the absolute reduction, like I said, 1.7%, which we're going to come back to in a moment. It's worth keeping in the back of your mind when you have a 1.7% um, absolute risk reduction, that means your number needed to treat to prevent a negative, a bad, out, a, a, a bad outcome is very low. I mean, we're talking about, what, 60 for an NNT? No, you're, you're right. It, it's interesting that, I mean... It, it, the way I think of it, just because it's easier for me to, to conceptualize it, is if I if I walk on in, in, on the street in front of my house, I have a certain risk of being hit by a car. If I stand in the in the um, just stand in front of my house in the lawn in front of my house, um, I have a, another risk of being hit by a car. The risk is much greater if I cross the street than if I just stand in front of on the on the grass in front of my house. Um, but I cross the street all the time and you know never get hit. So. The, still, the chances of my being hit are, are still extremely small, even though I cross the street, even though the relative risk is much higher. The absolute risk is is still very low of being hit by a car. And I think that's that's what people don't quite understand. 
This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about, where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies.